In my family growing up, uh, my mom's mom was grandma, and my dad's mom was granny. I don't know if they chose that just so that it would be easy to remember, but that's the way it was in my family. And my mom's mom, uh, our grandma, when we go to visit, uh, the visit was very short, and after a short time, we needed to go because grandma had kind of had enough of us. But when we go to my dad's mother's house, to granny's house, it was warm, it was loving, it was joy-filled, and this, and this family kind of, kind of revolved around my granny. She was the hub. She was the glue that held the family together. And a lot of families, a lot of situations in life, there's kind of that personality or that, that something that kind of, everything kind of coalesces around and connects with. And as we look at the book of Romans, the theme we're going to look at today is, is kind of, I would call it the hub. It's the thing at, at which all of the orthodoxy, all of our beliefs, starting at the beginning of Romans with sin and righteousness and faithfulness and peace and hope and salvation, uh, this, this picture of God, this doctrine of God, is, I think it's sort of like my granny was to our family, sort of that hub, the thing that every... And as a matter of fact, when my granny passed away, the family was different. They, they didn't gather in the same sort of way. And so to understand this doctrine we're going to talk about today, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, to understand the sovereignty of God is to see how all things hold together because the sovereignty of God is really about this God who rules all, this God who knows all, this God who is Lord of sovereign, in control of all things. God's sovereignty gives us the assurance and the hope that sin can be dealt with. God's sovereignty helps us understand the glory of his righteousness. God's sovereignty allows him to be faithful to us because he's Lord over all. In God's sovereignty, because he, he rules and reigns, we can have peace and we can have hope. The sovereignty of God, in a sense, kind of holds all of this together. So we need to understand what we mean when we talk about the sovereignty of God, that he is the God who rules over all. And so we're going to look together at a number of things that we learn in the book of Romans in this, in this conversation about orthodoxy. What is an orthodox view of the sovereignty of God? How in control is he of all things? How much is he Lord of all things? And when you understand the vastness of God's sovereignty... We kind of humbly get a perspective on ourselves, but everything kind of fits and coalesces and kind of holds together. And so we're going to look at some, some realities of the sovereignty of God and what it means for us in our lives. And then starting next week, we move into orthopraxy, how we live out all these things we've been learning. So here's our first lesson for the message today found in Romans chapter 9. We should face the hard reality, I am not in charge. Let me put it another way. I'm not sovereign. I'm not the Lord of all. I'm not in charge of the universe. I don't speak and things come to being. And we can forget that. If we're going to understand the sovereignty of God, we have to understand who we are in relationship to who he is. And ultimately, I am not in charge. I do not rule and reign in this universe. Look with me at Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. The Apostle Paul is, is sharing from the depth of his heart. In a sense, what he's saying is, I wish I was in charge. If I were sovereign, if I were in charge of the universe, there's things I could do that I simply can't do because I don't have that authority and power. I'm not sovereign. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 9, beginning in verse 2, from the depth of his soul, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Paul says, if I was in charge, if I had the power to do so, I would give up my own salvation for those who I love. Some of you might understand that feeling. Some of you would say, I would give anything to just give people what I have, a relationship with Jesus, the greatness of his grace, the hope we find in his name. But you know, and I know, and Paul understood. We can't do that. We're not sovereign. We're not in charge. Individuals have to choose to follow Jesus. We can't do it for them. As a matter of fact, God in his sovereignty and his authority and power doesn't force anyone to put their faith in him. He makes faith available to everyone. 
But somehow in God's sovereign glory and plan, he gives us the right to choose him or to reject him or to just not decide, which is a form of rejecting. If someone says, I'll never decide for Jesus, that ultimately over time becomes a form of rejection. If they go to their grave having not decided, the decision was no. And so we have to understand that, that, that this, this people that God made, this nation that God, that the people of Israel, God had blessed them to become a blessing to the world. He wanted to bring his message through them. He wasn't promising them because of their heritage or their bloodline, they had a special place, but they did have a special mission, a special calling. And so in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, we read that Abraham was called, that, that, that he would bring this message of being blessed to be a blessing to the nations. At the beginning of this ninth chapter of Romans, we get this perspective. We get an outlook that says, our hearts may long for all to be saved. Our hearts may long for certain people to be saved. We may wish we could, we could just snap our fingers or even give up our own salvation and make someone believe. But ultimately, that's not our place. We don't have that power. I don't think any of us walk around thinking that we're sovereign and Lord over all things, but sometimes we can act like it. Sometimes we can act like we know what's going on, we're in charge, we have authority. One of the things that happens when, when you face the hard reality that you're not in charge is you look to God as the sovereign Lord of the universe and you stop expecting yourself to have an answer for everything, to be able to fix everything, to make everything happen. You can begin to trust in God. If, if, you, if you wonder, you know, am I... Am I powerful enough to kind of have that role that God has, this role of sovereignty. All you have to do is have a child and you'll know you're not sovereign. You're not in charge of the universe. If you have a pet, you can't make your pet do everything you want it to do all the time. You're not sovereign. You're not the Lord. You don't, you don't rule over all. I remember early on in our marriage, Sherry and I bought a car. It was actually a van. We wanted to get a family van when we started having kids. A family van. It was a lemon. This, this van would just go from broken thing to broken thing to broken thing. And every time we put some more money in it, we think, okay, now it's going to work fine. If you've ever walked down this road, you know the frustration of it. You dump more money in, go, we put, paid so much for it, for it to start with, and it still doesn't work well. You put it, well, we'll just put a little bit more in, and you feel utterly, totally out of control. You know why you feel out of control in that moment? Because you are. We were. You know why you feel out of control sometimes? If you have kids that, that you want to be a certain way and they aren't that way? Because you're not in control. There is one being in the universe who is Lord of all, who is sovereign over all, who has power over all. And it is this, it's the God we worship. This one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who et exists eternally in three persons. He is sovereign. And when you understand that, all of your orthodoxy, the other beliefs, begin to come together. So here's a question. Do you know who rules, reigns, and is sovereign? Do you know with clarity, with confidence, the God I worship rules over all, reigns in heaven and on earth, and every knee will bow to him? The God that I worship is sovereign over all. And listen closely. That means over me and my life and my family and my children and grandchildren and nieces and nephews and my friends. This is one of the reasons that Christians pray to the God who is sovereign because we're not in control. We can't fix things. We can't make things right. But our God can and he does. And so understand that the God who rules and reigns and is sovereign is our God, and we can put our trust in him. Here's the second lesson from Romans on the sovereignty of God. God's sovereign choice is about faith and not family heritage. God in his sovereignty has decided that people will come to know him and be in relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ, God who came among us, and not through family heritage, not through bloodlines. And there are Christians who get this confused. There are Christians who are well-meaning. There are Christians I know and love and care about who have adopted a, a particular theological system and bent that says, well, the people of Israel are a, have sort of a special separate case. And God chose them, and they don't really need Jesus, the Messiah, to be saved. And yet God in his sovereignty is clear that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ. 
It's not, it's not because you, have, you grew up in the church. It's not because you have Jewish blood in your veins. It's not because your parents had you baptized. God is clear. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ alone. Look with me at Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. It is not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. What it's saying is not everyone who has a bloodline of, of the Israelite people are actually part of Israel. When people say, well, every Jewish person is this sort of special group and they're God's chosen people and they're going to go to heaven someday. That's not what this is saying. It says, not for, for not all who are descended of Israel are actually Israel. Nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. You say, well, no, if you have the blood, Jewish bloodlines, you're part of Abraham's family. But Paul is saying, inspired by the Holy Spirit, not so. He says, as a matter of fact, on the contrary. Keep looking at the passage. On the contrary. It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. That goes back to the, to the, the ancient patriarchal lineage that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, and here, let's make it clear. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children. Not by physical descent, by bloodlines of Jewish bloodlines. It is not children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. So he's saying the Jewish people who at that time in history were saying, because we have Jewish blood in our, our, our veins, we are God's chosen people, and we have this special sort of relationship with God. And Paul, Paul who is Jewish, and most of the early disciples were Jewish, he's saying, he's saying that's not how it works. It's not physical descent. It's not bloodlines that make someone God's children. But it's the promise. The promise of the Messiah. The hope of Jesus Christ. And we see this all through the book of Romans. So, so Paul is clarifying. In God's sovereign choice, we become part of his family. We become part of Abraham's family, the lineage of God's people, through faith in the promise of Jesus Christ. Not through family bloodlines of any sort. That's God's decision. Not mine, not yours. I, I believe it's a beautiful, powerful decision because it puts everyone on the exact same footing. We can come to God through faith in Jesus Christ and no one has a separate pathway. So here's a question for you. When did you figure out that our ways are not God's ways? When was it you sort of had that moment where your eyes opened up and you realized, wait a minute, my ways, our ways as people, they are not God's ways. God's ways are dramatically different. You see, because in the days of the Apostle Paul, this whole group of people, the Jewish people, had a way of seeing it. We are God's special chosen people. Chosen for privilege, chosen for salvation, chosen to be called his people. And what the scriptures is clear about is you are chosen to be a messenger of the message for all people, which is God's sovereign plan that everyone who walks on this planet at any time has a way to God. It's all the same for every person through Jesus Christ. When was your moment? This was a moment for many of the Jews to have a wake-up call and say, maybe our ways aren't God's ways. We think we have it all figured out. And God says, no, my plan is through faith in my son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. When did you have that wake-up call to recognize that God's ways are radically different than yours? I, I know for me, one of those moments was when I was a, a young man. I was dating someone. We'd been dating for, for a couple of years. We were talking about getting married. We actually met with a pastor who done a bit of counseling because we had, there were some tensions, there were some issues, but we were trying to figure it out were, were we the right people for each other. We would actually bought a car together and we were going away to Illinois to go to the same school. So, I mean, we were quite a ways down the road in this relationship. And I sat in a meeting at Garden Grove Community Church where I was working at the time, it was called the Crystal Cathedral, but I, I, I was working, running the summer camping ministries, and this camp up in the, in the, in the mountains, uh, Laurel Pines Camp, had brought their staff down to the church, and I brought my staff that was coming up there to use their facilities, and they were going to run the program. We were bringing the staff and the counselors, and going to have a great week together. And I remember sitting in a meeting, and they introduced one by one the staff of this camp. And when they got to Sherry Lynn Vleem and introduced my wife Sherry to the group, I'd never seen her, met her, I saw her, leaned over to my buddy next to me, Rick Zeiger, and I said, Rick, this is really weird, but that's my wife. I'm going to marry her. And he said, what's your girlfriend going to say? And I said, I don't know, but I'm going to talk to her about it today because this is really weird. That's my wife. 
Now, there's a whole story that goes on from there, and it wasn't, didn't happen immediately. And the, girl, the, the, woman, the, the woman I was dating, who was a great, wonderful Christian woman, uh, we were sort of at a point where we were trying to figure out what is this relationship, is this going, we had taken some steps down the road, but we kind of hit a pause button. And spoiler alert, I married Sherry. <laughs> but, but in a moment like that, I realized I had kind of thought, I'm going on this path, I think I have it figured out. I've taken a, quite a few steps along the way, and God steps in, God who is sovereign, God who rules and reigns. The God who we bow down and worship and we follow even when it doesn't totally make sense to us. And God says, I have a dramatically different plan for you. I look back and I praise him for that plan. But at the moment, all I could do is recognize. I can order my steps, plan my ways, and try to figure things out. But God is sovereign. He's on the throne. And to follow him is to walk the journey of figuring out where God is going and staying in step with his spirit and following his leading and not relying on my plans. That doesn't mean you don't plan ahead. That doesn't mean you don't think ahead. I love planning ahead. I love advanced planning. Ask anyone on staff, I'm a very serious advanced planner. But anytime, even when we have things planned for Shoreline, that God leads us in a new direction by his sovereign leading and plan, we drop our plans and we follow his. We, he gives us minds to try to figure out his plans and stay in step with the spirit. But if God says, okay, Thanks for the preparation, but we're going here. Man, you pack up and you go. You drop what you're doing and you go. And you realize that God's ways are not my ways, and my ways oftentimes are not God's ways. Here's a third lesson about sovereignty that we learn in the book of Romans. This is found in Romans 9, 14 to 33. We'll look at a couple of those verses in a moment. But here's the third lesson. Under God's sovereign hand, under his powerful lordship and sovereign hand, we see that all have sinned, all are lost, all are under judgment, and all are offered the hope of salvation. Every single person lost, every single person sought out by God, the sovereign God, and offered salvation. And, and it's interesting, for Christians, there's different schools of thought. There, there's kind of, kind of reformed theology that, that, that looks at a certain way and, and has a high view of God's sovereignty, but also a, a high view of God's hand and calling and electing and predestining, which comes up in the book of Romans. And they'll say, well, that's, that's God's choice of what he's doing. So you have, you, have, you have Reformed theology, but you also have Arminian theology, which would be the Wesleyan church and Methodist church and other churches. More Arminian theology would be saying, well, we have more of a say in it. It's more of our choice. God's still sovereign. He's still in, in control. But, but we, you know, we have more say in what's happening. And the reform would say more, it's more God's sovereign choice. And here's more our human decision. And, and there are Christians across that spectrum who love Jesus, who believe this book is true from beginning to end. And so if you say, well, if there's you know, Christians who take the Bible seriously that have varied perspectives, you might stop and say, well, maybe that means that there's some truth in all of that and, and that there, there's, there's a broader perspective than maybe I have in my own mind, in my own heart. When I stopped being a senior pastor uh, some years back, before I came to Shoreline, I had about three years, three and a half years that I wasn't a senior pastor. After 14 years in one church, I felt God call me by his sovereign leading to stop being a senior pastor for about three to four years so I could write the organic outreach book so my wife and I could beta test what we were doing and we could launch this ministry of organic outreach which has become now Organic Outreach International. And so in that time, I wasn't the lead pastor of any church. So I got a call from a reformed church, a large reformed church in the Chicago area who said, can you come and preach for us once a month, be our, our teaching pastor and preach for us once a month in our weekend services and also once a month in our midweek services. And at the same time, I had a Wesleyan church, an Arminian church, call me and say, can you be our teaching pastor and come and preach every four to six weeks in our, in our weekend services? So I have a Reformed church and a Wesleyan church who have different views of some of these issues, both call me to be their teaching pastor. And I said yes to both of them. Because I thought, oh, gosh, if I'm preaching just a weekend here and a weekend there and I have two weekends open, that's like working half time. But, I was, but, but so here's this one theological perspective and here's the second theological perspective. And I spent three and a half years preaching at both those churches. And listen closely, I never once got any pushback for the theology I brought. And you say, well, wait a minute. They're, they're in very different places theologically, but here's the trick. I just always use this book. <laughs> I'd preach from God's word. And so we would look at this. I remember one time in, in, the, in the Wesleyan church, 
I talked about the fact that God, God gets a hold of us. John chapter 10, where we're told that, that no one can snatch us from the Father's hand. No one can snatch us from Jesus' hand. That he and the Father are one. And I talked about this idea of, of God's security and holding us tight. But because I took it from the Bible, nobody came and said, well, wait a minute. We might have a little different view on that. And, and so here's something I've learned in, really in, in recent years when I'm talking with people and when I'm grappling with these issues of, of maybe different theological perspectives or different outlooks on life. When somebody asks me, are you this or this? And I, I think I've said this one time before in a service, but I think it's very helpful for lots of areas of life. If somebody says, are you Reformed or are you, are you Arminian? And I've been asked that question. Here's what I say. I look at them and I say this. I'm a biblical Christian. Ask me a specific question, I'll give you a specific answer. They want to ask, if, I, if, I, if you say you're Reformed, then I think I know everything about you, and I know what you think about everything. If you say you're Arminian, I know everything about you. I won't answer that. It's too easy. I'll say, I, I am a biblical Christian. Let's have a conversation. Now, you might ask me some questions. We might talk, and you might decide you think you know where I stand. But I'm not going to be locked into a title. I'm going to be locked into the Word of God and the person of Jesus. I say the same thing when people ask me when it comes to the area of women in ministry. They'll say, are you egalitarian or complementarian? You might not even know what those words mean, but are you egalitarian or are you complementarian? There's two different views of women in ministry, and particularly the ordination of women. And I'll look at them and I'll say, I'm a biblical Christian. Ask me a personal question, specific question, I will give you an honest answer. If people ask me, are you Republican or Democrat? Take a guess what I say. I'm a biblical Christian. Ask me a specific question, I'll give you a specific answer. Because the minute you give a one-word response, I'm this or this, people think they know everything about you and they love you or hate you because of that one word. I won't let people do that. I'll say, ask me questions. Ask me what I believe about life. And I'll tell you what I believe about life. That God is the giver of life and it's not our place to take life from the beginning to the end. I'll let's have a conversation. Don't just take one word and define me. Ask me what I believe about, about the sovereignty of God. Ask me what I believe about the gifts of people. We can have a conversation. I encourage you to become a person who has conversations, who doesn't let people peg you with one word and think they know everything about you. And, and so we go on in Romans to recognize that God says that all are welcomed to come to Jesus, that God knows all people and he knows what they're going to do and what they're thinking, that salvation is available to everybody but that not everyone receives the gift of salvation. And one of the things that Romans is dealing with is how do we know who's saved and who's not saved? Does God choose people to be saved and not choose other people to be saved? It's, it's a very complicated topic. But what we understand is that if we're biblical Christians, we grapple with a biblical text. And so the apostle go, goes on and he start, begins to quote from the book of Romans. I, I'm sorry, because it, uh, he begins to quote from the book of Hosea in the book of Romans. So in Romans 9, 25, and 26, we actually have passage, part of the passage of, uh, of, of Hosea, the book of Hosea coming out. And, and we read this and we recognize that God is saying, it's my work, it's my hand in all of this. I will do what I will do. I am God. So listen to these words. Romans 9, 25 to 26, coming directly from the book of Hosea. As he says in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people. God says, that's up to me. People who are not my people, I'll call them my people. And I will call her my loved one who is not my loved one. And in every place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. And this is actually a play off of the names of Hosea's children. But what he's really saying is, I will call people my own people. I will call people my children. I will call them to myself. God says, that's up to me. He is a God who calls, who draws, who works. He's sovereign over all. So in our salvation and all that happens in the world, God is involved. Now, how exactly does that work behind the veil of eternity? I don't pretend to know. And I think when we try to figure it all out and dissect it, it's kind of like taking, it's kind of like taking a frog in a lab class and you say, okay, we're going to dissect this frog. By the time you're done dissecting a frog, it's dead. If you dissect a frog, well, it's dead. If we take the word of God and try to dissect it and say, I've got to figure out every single thing, by the time we're done, we're killing the word of God. There's a point where there is mystery. There's a point where we say, I humbly acknowledge, I don't fully understand, but God is at work here. So here's a question for you. Can you live with the mystery of God's sovereign will? Can you live a life that says, God is on the throne. He rules and reigns. He's at work in every life but I don't totally understand how it works. 
I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't totally understand how, how a carburetor works, but I drive a car. I don't totally understand how when I turn the light switch on, the lights come on. Electricians do. I don't. But I'm okay with that. I don't totally understand the sovereign will of God. And I never will. But I'm okay with that. Because God's on the throne and I trust him. A fourth lesson from Romans. God's sovereign plan is to save all people. And there's lots of discussion about this in, in groups of Christians. Well, no, God, Jesus only died for the elect, or Jesus only died for certain people, or Jesus died for everyone. Well, when you look at the biblical text, I don't think you can get away from the fact that the, the death of Jesus was for all people and available to all people. Look at Romans 10, verse 4. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. And somebody says, well, then, then it's just for those who believe. Well, it's for everyone who believes in him. And then go with me to verse 8. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith, the faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you, are, that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess your faith and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Anyone who believes in him, anyone, everyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ will be saved. Believe it in your heart, proclaim it with your lips. I don't think you can read the word of God and come away with any conclusion other than the death of Jesus Christ is enough for all people. It is big enough and great enough. And it is available to all people. We get to choose if we're going to respond. And there's something very important for Christians, biblical Christians, to understand. And if you're a note taker, write this down. There is not universal salvation. But there is a universal offer of salvation. There is not universal salvation. It's not saying everyone will be saved. But there's a universal offer of salvation. The death of Jesus, his resurrection, and the price he paid is enough for all people, and everyone is invited in. Everyone is welcomed in. So here's the question. Do you recognize that when you found Jesus, he was already looking for you? Think about it. People say, oh, I found Jesus. I reasoned my way to Jesus, partially, but him, the perfect living God, was looking for you, and by his spirit, he was drawing you. I studied and figured out who Jesus was. Great, but Jesus knew who you were before you were born. I, my heart sought after Jesus, and, and, and I was a seeker of God. Great, but long before you were seeking him, while you were lost in sin, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He knew your name before you were born, and he died on the cross long before you were born to pay the price for your sins. And on the cross, Jesus knew your name, he knew your sins, and he offered himself completely for you. That is glorious. That is our sovereign, glorious, powerful God. So we seek God and we look for him, but when we find him, we discover that he was looking for us all along. And if he hadn't sent his Holy Spirit to, to soften our hearts and draw us to him, I don't think any of us would ever come. So even our salvation and our seeking of him and our faith in a way is a gift of his grace. He is gracious and good to us. A fifth lesson in Romans about sovereignty. In a sovereign plan, God sends us out to share his good news. Part of God's sovereign plan is not just to, to share that good news with us, but it's once we know him that we become messengers of that grace, of that good news. Look at me at Romans 10. Verses 14 and 15. So how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can people there who've never believed in God, how do they call on God if they've never believed in him? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? They can't believe unless they hear something. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? That word preaching is, is probably better to say proclaiming or declaring. How can they hear without somebody sharing the story? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Every one of us is called to share our story, to share his story. This last week in our staff time together, we all talked about how do we share our story of how we came to faith in Jesus and how do we share stories 
of how God is faithful and present and powerful and, and brings peace in our lives, that God is real and alive and present. And everyone on our staff spent time practicing sharing their story with each other. Why? Because every one of us are called in the sovereign plan of God to bring his good news. Now, technically about 3 to 4% of Christians are called with the ministry of an evangelist and the gifting and the calling of an evangelist, 3 to 4%. But 100% of Christians are called to shine the light of Jesus. 100% of Christians are called to do what Peter writes about, to give an account for the hope that they have with gentleness and respect. We're all called to tell our stories of Jesus. So here's a question for you. Are you following God's plan for you to shine his light? Are you personally engaged in shining the light of Jesus to family members, friends, people at your, at your grade school, your college, your high school, uh, people in your neighborhood, people in your workplace? Are you shining the light? Are you sharing the story? And I want to give you a challenge. God in his sovereignty has made a way for salvation to be offered to all people. And once we know him, God in his sovereignty says, you're part of my family now. You go out and share the good news, the story of Jesus. I want to challenge you to start praying. If you, if you stop doing this, we've done this a lot in the past, or if you've never done it. Every day, set an alarm on your phone at one o'clock in the afternoon, to ring. And that when it rings, you pray for one person that doesn't know Jesus for one minute. At one o'clock, pray for one person for one minute. My wife started doing that and the one o'clock afternoon didn't work, so she did it at nine o'clock at night and she says it's her 911 call. She makes to God every night. She makes a 911 call every night. And for years, at nine o'clock at night when that would ring, Sherry and I would pray for my dad. If she was not with me, she'd pray for my dad. That was her 911 call. God, will you draw Terry Harney to yourself every day for one minute she would pray or we would pray and now she has a new name she's praying for every night at nine o'clock because my dad came to faith in Jesus praise God would you set your clock your, your alarm on your phone at one o'clock or nine o'clock and at that time pray for one person that you love and care about that doesn't know Jesus for one minute and keep doing it till they come into faith in Jesus would you learn to share the gospel story I want to challenge you I wrote a book years ago called Organic Outreach for Ordinary People. How do we share the good news of Jesus in natural ways? I have in that book a bunch of different ways for you to naturally share your faith. If you want to get that book, contact the church. We will give it to you at cost. We'll sell it to you at cost. If you can't afford it at all, we'll give you a copy. But if you can't afford it, pay cost on it. And if you can afford to pay for two of them, buy one for somebody else. Sherlyn always helps each other. But I wish that you would take that and study it and find three or four ways to tell the story of Jesus so you are prepared to give an account for the hope that is in you. And then number six. In his sovereignty, God calls, he foreknows, he chooses and elects, and this is all an act of grace. God knows who will be saved. He knows who will refuse him. And people will say then, then according, to, you know, and according to, to, uh, philosophy, well, if God knows that it has to happen, therefore it's predestined. I don't know how all that works. That's behind the veil, beyond my wisdom, and probably beyond yours too. But the Bible is clear that he knows, he chooses, he elects, but it's all through grace. And I actually believe that God gives us the freedom to choose, so God knows who will freely choose him. That God foreknows what will happen, but we don't come to know him because he forces us to. We have a freedom to choose him, but he knows who will choose him. But God knows what's going on. In Romans eleven six, 6, we read this. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. That the pathway to Jesus is always paved with the grace of God revealed in Jesus Christ. It's not God forcing us to believe in him. It's not God man manipulating us. It's God in his grace offering a way. And for all who choose that way, he longs that all would come to a knowledge of salvation, that no one would perish, and that all that do, God knows they will, and he delights in it. It's a, it's a, it's a mind bender. It's hard to put your head around God's sovereignty because it's bigger than we are, but we trust in him and his wisdom. And then seventh and finally, God's sovereign power makes us one. The sovereign power of God binds us together. Look with me at Romans chapter 11. Verses 17 to 20. 
In Romans 11, 17 to 20, we read these words. And it's talking to this picture of, of, a, of an olive tree where there's branches that were kind of born into the tree and then branches that are, in, branches that are engrafted in and become part of it. But the idea is that he's, God's bringing together the original planting of his people, Israel, but all those he implants to that, the people of God, and they all become the true people of God. Romans eleven seventeen 17 says this. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root, you become part of God's family and you're engrafted in, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, well, branches were broken off that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief. They didn't believe. They, became, they, they removed themselves from the family of God. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. Say, God, I'm humbled that in your sovereignty you would give your life for me on the cross. I'm humbled that you would invite me to yourself. I'm humbled that you would make salvation available. And somehow, by the inviting work of your spirit, I responded and accept it. And now I'm implanted into your family and engrafted into your family. That is humbling to me. I don't arrogantly say, look at me. I'm part of this. I say, oh God, but by your grace, only by your grace, and in your grace I stand and I live. So a question. Are you ready to embrace anyone and everyone God calls to himself? Because God's sovereign, because God is building his church, everyone God invites in becomes family to you and family to me. We humbly say, Lord, we, invite, we ask you to invite everyone in. And whoever you invite in, we will delight in and call family. And I love how this portion ends. And this kind of wraps up the end of our orthodoxy part. And, and the sovereignty of God is just dripping out of, these, out of these closing verses in Romans 11, verses 33 through 36. Listen to these closing words as sort of a closing word of blessing on us as we're finishing this part of our study of Romans. We'll start next week, a six-week series on orthopraxy, living out our faith. Romans eleven thirty-three 33 says this. Oh, the depth of of the riches, of the wisdom and knowledge of God so deep we can't comprehend. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. We cannot figure this God out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Here's the answer. Nobody fully knows the mind of God or nobody's been his counselor. Who has ever given to God that God would repay them? Who can ever say, God, you owe me? No one. Why? He's sovereign. He rules over all. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Oh God, to you be the glory forever and ever. Sovereign God, sovereign Lord, you rule over all. You rule over our lives. So humble our hearts and bow our knees. And let us take part in your mission, not knowing who will respond, but knowing that you are on the throne. God, celebrating that your salvation is big enough for all people and offered to all people, and we long that all would come just like you do. Make us faithful to your call, humble in our position, and diligent to shine your light everywhere we go. We pray this, Jesus, in your name and for your glory. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple quick invitations. If you want prayer right now, if you need prayer for anything, will you call the number below right now? Make that call and let us pray for you and support you. If you're new, will you text the word welcome to the number below? And if you'll text that word welcome, we'll follow up and get to know you and give you a warm personal welcome. If you have questions about anything at Shoreline Church, just send those questions to info at Shoreline, that, that address below, and we will get back to you and answer your questions. Next Sunday is a big Sunday for Shoreline. Next Sunday, we go to all live worship. You can join us live in worship in your car, in the parking lot of the church here. You can join us live in the courtyard, or you can join us live at home. But now pay attention now, at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock, because we're live streaming, 
So when, when I'm preaching next week, each sermon coming up, it's happening the moment you're watching it. We're live streaming to you. So it's at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock and after 11 o'clock afternoon at any time on demand. But 9 and 11 will all be together live. So if you're online, get on at about quarter to 9 or quarter to 11 and join in with us. And we got some virtual lobby before and some fun stuff going on. So we look forward to seeing you on campus in the, in the parking lot or in the courtyard. Register for that or live at home where you are. And then finally, this podcast we've been doing, we're getting a great response to And so every week, we're doing a podcast to go deeper into the topics. If you want to go deeper, there'll be a little promo right after I say amen and send you off with a word of blessing. And so now I want to give you a word of blessing. And I want to, I want to use these words from this doxology, this, these closing words of the book of Romans chapter 11. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Walk in his sovereignty. Celebrate his sovereignty. Delight in it and trust in him. Walk in peace and hope because God is on the throne. God bless you. Enjoy the short video and we'll see you next Sunday. This is a clip from the latest episode of our Shoreline Conversations podcast. Stick around to the end to find out how to listen or watch the full episode. And people are just about labeling, you know, they're about, you know, if you can, if you can tweet it and label it and say it in 15 to 30 seconds, it's probably not worth much. Yeah. Um, we've got it. We've got to get more intentional about conversing and talking. So, so I, I had a, um, uh, a first year college student I knew who went away to college and went away to a Bible school. Yeah. And they studied uh, Reformed theology and Armenian theology. And they came back and, uh, and the first time I interacted with them after being gone for their first semester of college. Mm -hmm. And they said, are you Reformed or Arminian? And so I said to this, this person, they said, are you Reformed or Arminian? And I said, I said, I'm a biblical Christian. Ask me a specific question. I'll give you a thoughtful answer. We can have a conversation. Yeah. They said, no, just are you Reformed or Arminian? And I said, not going to answer the question. And they got a little bit, they got a little bit miffed. And, <laughs> and uh, that's the theological term, yeah, miffed. miffed. Yeah. Uh, but they, they, were, they were a little bit irritated at me. And they, and, they, and, and they said, well, you know, my professor said that people who won't, won't answer that question are hiding. Yeah. And I said, well, your professor's um, <laughs> not, not as smart as he or she thinks they are. Uh, be, because... They're, they were forcing young students yeah. to create this dichotomy and, and to, to fall into this trap of one word. You know, for most people, if they ask you a question like that, in the, same, in, the same, in the theological world, a question like that is not unlike in the political world, somebody saying, are you a Republican or Democrat? Mm -hmm. Most people, when they ask that question, they believe in their mind that if you say one word, they know everything about you. Yeah. They know what you believe about yeah. everything, but no one is that simple. You can find the full episode on our website, YouTube channel, or any major app or platform that hosts podcasts. Just search for Shoreline Conversations and be sure to let us know what you think with a review and subscribe. 